That's Teddy Bear, huh? Uh-huh. How old is Teddy Bear? He's about three years old. Three years old? Yeah. Still a pup. He was found wandering the streets. We adopted him from one of those no-kill shelters. Oh, did you adopt him? Yeah. But you had to go to the shelter to get him? Well, no, they had a, uh, a display. The shelter was actually in Pahrump. Uh-huh. And uh, they had, like, a Saturday special where they came over to Las Vegas. And they had it at a home uh, pet shop. Oh, so he's actually a Pahrump dog. He came. A, yeah, they found him wandering the streets. He was just a puppy then. So, Marilyn, you've been on dialysis for how long? Five years now, since 2012. And right now, how many times a week do you have to go? You go three times a week, and chair time for me is three hours and 45 minutes, but you're usually there four and a half hours each session. And it pretty much wears you out each time. Well, everyone is different the way they react to it. Mm -hmm. With me, when I come off of dialysis, I'm shot for the rest of the day. So I schedule my dialysis for late in the afternoon. That way when I come home, I can just chill out. I don't have to do any work around the house or anything really. Some people don't have that. Some people feel energized after dialysis. With me, I'm exhausted afterwards. But the next day, you're pretty next much... Next day, I'm fine. You're recuperated next right. day. Right. Next day, I'm fine. But the strange thing is, it changes for everybody. I mean... Everyone is unique. Actually, one person could actually be energized. Right. For that day. Right. I've seen some of the, you know, some of the people get up and say they feel fantastic afterwards. Ready to go. They're ready to run out and have a good time. Wow. Yeah. So, I realize, so, Marilyn, you're not a professional, but you've been going experience in this for five years. Right. I, I have no medical background at all. I just have five years of hands-on experience with it. And there are things that I noticed uh, when you first start dialysis. You get more or less thrown into it. And uh, it's scary. And there's a lot of things that you're not aware of that you should be aware of. But when I started dialysis, they told me, show up at a time. And I was off and running. I had no training, nothing nothing to go on. And for the first year, you do have a lot of questions trying to figure it out. I realize this is a very scary experience for anybody who, when they first encounter it, what do they have to expect in a situation like this? Well, the first thing they can expect is that they probably will have what's called a permaport in their chest. They put it in medically, uh, usually with a uh, radiologist will put it in. You have to be very, very careful of your permaport. You have to keep it dry. Okay, the first thing I want to tell people about is that they will probably go into hemodialysis with a permaport. That's a medically inserted uh, catheter, usually in your chest. It usually has two dangling wires on it. It's very, very important for a beginning dialysis patient to keep that permaport dry. When you're taking a shower, what I used to do is I used to put it in a Ziploc bag for the two dangling portions, and then I would fold the bag up and cover the uh, entry site, and then I would just tape it. If you get it wet, if you get the dressing on it wet, you have to have it changed right away. There's so many people that get infections from their permaport, and it's very close to your heart. So it's essential that you keep it clean and dry. Do the doctors tell you this? Uh, do they really? No, they never explained anything to me. I came up with the Ziploc bag on my own. They have something that you can buy online, which is a plastic covering, but it's very expensive. The Ziploc bag did me well for a couple of years because I had problems with my arms and they always put me back on the permaport. It was a learning experience for you. It was a learning experience. You just had to find out for yourself. Okay, the next thing they're going to do is they're going to put a fistula in your arm. Usually when you put a fistula in your arm, it will take about a month for it to heal to the point where they can use it. 
So you're going to be using that permaport while the fistula heals. It's very important for you to get a little soft rubber ball and squeeze it constantly during the day. I used to do it for every 15-20 minutes I would squeeze the ball, then I'd put it down for a couple of hours, pick it up and start squeezing again. It helps the fistula to mature. When they put the fistula in your arm, it's very important for you to get a soft rubber ball and to squeeze it for 20 minute sessions all during the day. It helps the fistula grow and mature so that you get a nice healthy blood flow through it. Okay. When your fistula is mature, they will start you going uh, with needles going into your arm to hook it up and they will pull the permaport. It will heal. You won't have any problems then with it. Fistulas are preferred over the permaport because they give you better circulation of the blood and they're less likely to get infected. Okay. Um, when you're ready to start hemodialysis, the first thing the doctors are going to tell you is to show up at the center at, say, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. They don't tell you 2 o'clock is your chair time. The technicians want you there 15 minutes in front of 2 o'clock so that you can get hooked up to the machine properly. The first two or three times I showed up right when they told me to, 2 o'clock. And the technician was, first they were a little bit like, oh, you're here finally. And they didn't tell me, you have to be here 15 minutes up front. So be warned, you want to be at the center 15 minutes before your chair time. So they will have time to call you in and hook you up. When you arrive at the center, nobody greets you. You just sit down in the lobby. When the technician has the chair ready for you, she will come to the door of the treatment room and call you in. First thing you do when you go into the treatment room is to weigh yourself. Now they weigh you in kilos instead of in pounds, which is nice because I don't want those great big numbers shouted out, right? But they will base the amount of fluid that they pull from you on your starting weight. Why, why do you think they go with kilos instead of pounds? Why do you I think it's because it's easier to measure the liquids. When they give you an IV bag or saline, bag, a serene, you know, fluid, it's always in kilos. I think it's just their medical preference to handle it better. Um, usually, if I'm uh, short, they'll or if I cramp, they'll give me 200 kilos, 300 kilos, 500 kilos. It's always in kilos, though. Okay. Um, after they weigh you in. You, they'll sit you in your chair, get you comfortable, put your feet up. One thing I want to tell you now, when you are sitting in that chair, you're going to be in that chair for four hours. You make sure you bring a blanket with you because those treatment rooms are cold. Most of the treatment rooms have televisions that require headphones. So bring a, a set of headphones with you. Bring a cup an empty cup just so you can get some water or some ice. You're going to be sitting there for four hours and at the end of four hours you might be really dry. Can you bring like a bottle of water with you? You can bring a bottle of water with you but they have an, usually they have the ice and water machine by the scale. And you okay. cannot get up for the whole time you're there you cannot no, get up. you are hooked up to the machine with needles going into your arm to a big machine. There have been cases where there have been emergencies where you felt sick and you had to get to the bathroom. They come over, disconnect you, you use the facilities, you come back and they reconnect you. Instead of being there for like three hours and 45 minutes, you're there four and a half hours. So it's best because to get it done all It's of best to get it done in advance and to be prepared. Okay, when I go for my treatment, I actually bring a laptop because I find that a lot of times I can get some work done, I can answer emails, whatever, and it's more productive for me. Okay, so you're in your chair, you got your blanket on you, you're hooked up, you and your technician decide what 
goal you'll meet for your water pole. Usually when you first go in, it's hit or miss on the water. So if the doctor says, well, she should weigh 125 pounds and she's 127 pounds, uh, try pulling two and a half kilos or two kilos. The technicians will always add on a, a 500 kilos, a 500 onto your, or half a kilo, onto your weight because they give you that much in fluid to get the machine started. So if you tell them to pull one kilo from you, you tell them one kilo from me, half from you, total of one and a half. That way there's no misunderstanding if the technician pulls too many, too much water from you. Does that happen often, they pull too much water? Yes. It happens and often. And that's another video. That's a whole different video. That's a whole, what you can expect. But you can quickly, you can kind of prevent that from happening? By monitoring your water yourself. I see. Okay. The other thing that you The water be, intake, your water intake. The water in intake has to be monitored. They tell you to drink two kilos a day max. I've seen some men go into that dialysis center where they have to have six kilos pulled off of them. All right? Usually it's because they, they may have had a few beers, and the salt in the beer makes them retain more water. But the techs can't pull that much water from you. So they either have to have two treatments in a row, like one day and then come in the next day, and then the following day is a th their regularly scheduled treatment. So they're going just about every day a week. So week. it's a big, big no-no to drink alcohol. It's a big no-no. So if you do drink alcohol, you're going to be going there almost every day? If you do drink alcohol and it makes you retain water, you will be going there more than you would want. They will become your second home. Right. All right. I have had people tell me that they can have a glass of red wine while they're on uh, chemo. I don't drink at all, so, you know, I can't vouch for that or say, oh, you know, I just don't. All right. So the, the, the technician will then set the machine up. She will check the numbers as they're being pulled. And then she will go on to her second patient or her next patient. You'll sit there for three hours. During that time, she'll come by and she'll check the machine. The RN in charge of the room will come by and check the machine. Sometimes they don't come by often enough. They don't come by often enough and the machine will start beeping. Usually when it beeps, uh, they'll come by, they'll hear the beeping. If they're preoccupied and do not hear the beeping, make sure you call them over if it's been more than five minutes before they come because that beeping stops your dialysis time and adds additional time onto the back end. So right. when it, when it, when the machine's not working, so if it's you beeping. Lose, right. If you lose 10 minutes because of the beeping or because they have to do something corrective, that 10 minutes is added on to the back end. So you're there longer. And you don't want that. You really don't. Sometimes you run into problems on your dialysis. You might be clotting. Um, the machine may have um, the pull may have stopped or slowed down below the volume that they want for some reason and they'll have to adjust the needles. Uh, sometimes it, it just goes off on its own. Sometimes your blood pressure cuff, which you're wearing during the entire treatment, sometimes that goes awry and your blood pressure is registering too low. So they'll come over and they'll make the necessary adjustments and get you back running again. Okay. Um, one thing you should note, when you see all these people walking around, the blue coats that they wear are the nurses. The white coats are the technicians. The yellow coats are just visitors or caretakers. So if someone comes over and starts talking to you and you say, I really need the nurse, and she's got the white coat on, you know she's a tech, she's not a nurse. There's a big difference between a nurse and a technician. That, that's right. There's a big difference in their level of education and their skill levels. Most when of, when would you need a nurse during the uh, when your when your blood pressure goes awry, 
Um, I used to get tachycardia. If they pull too much water, my heart rate would go like 120, 126, 130. And then I would have to have the nurse come over. Okay. Sometimes if they pull too much water or they don't pull enough water and they're taking you off, your pressure is off. It's, it's either too high or too low. They will call the nurse over. Okay. Uh, sometimes what, what happens if, uh, if your blood pressure is really high that day? Um, they have to bring it down before you can exactly. carry they on? Can't put, if your blood pressure is so high that they call the nurse over when you first go in, they cannot put you on the machine if it's really up. Uh, the numbers come in in red when the machine gives a warning. And they will call the nurse over and uh, they'll try it two or three times to see if the machine is acting up or if your pressure is really that high. They'll have you sit down, put your head back, do whatever they can. If they can't get the pressure down, they'll put you into the, they'll call the paramedics and you'll go off to the ER. So, and then, uh, I guess there's drugs, they have drugs that would... Yeah, the doctors can administer those, though, but, but they you, can't do it at the center. So you have to go to the emergency room to get your blood pressure down. Right. And then they'll reschedule you for another time for your dialysis. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, the opposite has happened to me, where my pressure dropped so low that I had to go to the ER. Too low. And I also get tachycardia, which is the racing heart. If they take out too much water... I get tachycardia. Okay, when you first start on your dialysis treatments, the amount of water being pulled from you is more of an estimation on the part of the professionals. They will tell you what they think you should weigh and they will pull those kilos from you, that water kilo weight, so that when you leave you are at that, their desired weight. Sometimes it's not always the correct way. Sometimes when you're on the machine, especially as a new patient, you develop muscle cramps. The best thing I can tell you about muscle cramps is that they last about five minutes. Just about everybody experiences a severe, painful muscle cramp? I would say about 90% of the people have muscle cramps within the first week of dialysis may not be the first day, maybe the second or the third day, but the best thing you can say about them is that they last about five minutes. If you feel one coming on, immediately call for the nurse. Tell her I'm cramping in my ankle because that cramp will only get worse. She will stop the water flow pull from your machine and she will ask you if you want water. Depending on the severity of the cramps, she will give you water to make the cramp ease up. And the cramp could be anywhere from your ankle up to your leg? or It can go as high as just, I knew one girl who had it in her stomach. Her stomach. I mean, she was in a lot of pain. I usually get them in my legs. And it's important to call the nurse and shut the machine off. You, well, you don't shut the machine off, you shut the water pull off. So the machine is still filtering and cleaning, it's just not taking more water from you. And if the cramping does not abate with that, then she will, the nurse will give you water to help ease the pain. Some of the nurses will press on your foot if you have a cramp in your foot. None of that really alleviates it. Um, the best thing that I found that helps me is I lie flat because it's a reclining chair. I'll lie flat. I'll have them stop the water pull, and then I'll have them give me water at 100 uh, kilos at a time because I don't want to put in a whole bunch of water at once if I don't need to. It'll only make my weight go up at the end of the treatment. Like I said, the best thing you can say about them is that they last about five minutes. The doctors don't really warn you about these, do they? Or they uh, the first time it happened to me, I let out with the F-bomb. <laughs> I mean, it hurts it so pink. bad. And I have seen six-foot men in tears because they had such bad cramps. Very painful. Yeah, it's very, very painful, and it's it's not something you want to see someone go through. So there is a procedure that when you when it first feel it, there's a procedure to get that nurse over there. Yeah, after, after you have them for a while, after you've gone through them for a while, 
you can feel the start of it. You can feel like your ankle's tightening or your muscle may have a spasm. Call the nurse over right away. It's easier to fix it when it's just starting than when it's full blown. Sure. Okay. You've had your treatment, you survived a muscle cramp, and you're ready to be taken off the machine. What they do is they will come over, they will clean your access site, they'll pull the needles, they'll check your blood pressure again to make sure it hasn't dropped. Um, you will hold it yourself for about five minutes. You'll hold your arm where the needles were inserted. This is to make it coagulate so you don't have blood running down your arm. Uh, one other thing that I did want to mention. When you're on dialysis, it is not supposed to hurt your arm when they're doing the treatment. If you find that your arm is in pain, call the nurse. You're not supposed to feel anything. Usually, uh, if you're feeling pain, it's because the blood flow is incorrect. Uh, you might have uh, what's called uh, steel syndrome, which is what took me off of the arms. You might have swelling in your hand. Call the nurse right away and get it corrected. They may have to send you to the uh, access center where they treat the accesses and clean them out. Uh, or they may have to tell you that you can't use that arm, which is what happened with me. What, did you use the other arm? Then they tried the other arm, and that failed as well. So I get it right now in the leg. You get it in the leg. Right. Is that like 50-50 people, arms, legs? No, most people get it in their arm. Most people have three points in their arm that they can use for access. Down by the wrist, below the elbow, and above the elbow. So if, it, if they go in when they're putting in the fistula and they don't see large enough veins, they'll go higher. But there's definitely not supposed to be any pain in the procedure. There is not supposed to be any pain. Okay, well they're taking you off of the machine now. When you leave the center, they'll check your blood pressure to make sure it hasn't altered or isn't detrimental to you. And then they'll ask you to go get your weight again. And usually it will be what, what they call a target weight. You'll have found you've lost maybe two kilos, maybe one kilo, whatever it was that you wanted to have pulled. Once you do that, the technician should go with you to the scale in the beginning. And then she should carry your bag for you out to the waiting room. Then you have the pleasure of waiting for your ride home. And, and, that, done. and that does it, huh? That's, and it, that's a standard treatment. What's the longest treatment you ever had to go through? Longest time? The longest time was four hours, and it took four and a half hours to finish because it's 15 minutes to get you on, 15 minutes to get you off. What's the shortest amount of time that you've ever... Usually they don't want to take you off the machine at less than two hours, max, you know, minimum. Um, if it's if you're having cramps and your pressure is dropping or your heart rate is racing, they will take you off right away. So there are actually days where you can be done in two and a half hours? Yes. How would they know? How, how do they know? Usually if they take you off in two and a half hours, it's because of a problem. A problem. Right. Uh, I've had it where I've gone in. I've had problems with the permaport in the chest and they were only able to do two hours before it was solidified or clotted. Also to be clear, to, for, a success, success, for a successful uh, experience, it has to be over three hours. It has to be the time that they designate. A lot of people try to cut it short. They're only hurting themselves. They have to go for that full time. Hmm. And if you skip a treatment, you're only hurting yourself. Would somebody like a big man who's six foot five would he, his treatment last longer than a smaller person? Yes, okay. yes. And a heavier person has a longer time than a smaller person. So it does matter. Right, it does matter. Um, and like I said, I've seen this, this one fellow I know. He's got to be about six foot two, and he looks like a biker dude. In fact, that's what I call him, biker dude, right? And he has to go four days a week, four hours each day, 
because he holds too much water. Do you think he's drinking a little bit? Yeah. He might be drinking. He's dr a biker dude. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> he's not going to uh, make change his life. No, he's, it, you know, he, he just looks like that's where, you know, he's got the tats and he's got the earrings and the bald head. Uh -huh. he, and he comes in in his leather. I mean, he looks like a biker dude, and that's just the way it is. So you develop friendships uh, with people yeah. over there. Right, right. We, I don't call them friendship. I, I call them acquaintances. Right. But, right? but we become friendly. We talk among ourselves. That's one of the reasons I decided on this video because I was talking with one of the caretakers. Her husband was on it, and uh, she said the same thing as I. She was just thrown into it. No one told her what to expect. No one told her what he would be going through. There's just um, not a lot of information out there, is there? No, there isn't. Now, I watched the uh, one video on YouTube, um, that comedian that's on HBO, John something. Anyway, he did a, a segment on Davida which is one of the dialysis companies. But he didn't go into any of the treatment for the people. He concentrated on the company. And one thing he said is that they had a training program for new people. Well, I've been now in two different uh, DeVita offices. I never was given any training. I was just, the most training I got was a printed sheet with little pictures of fruits and vegetables saying, do not eat this. Not a whole lot of training. No. They don't. They don't do it. Um, it's just not done. So that's what that's part of your motivation to make this video, huh? To that's my primary motivation is to make this video. So someone going in who is scared doesn't get overwhelmed. They say, all right, I know I can go through this. I know I can handle it. It's going to be four hours. I'm gonna, I may cramp, but it's only five minutes. I can handle it, right? I know about the weight. I know who I'm talking to, or yellow coat, white coat, blue coat. We weren't given any of that information. We were just told, sit down in the chair, let me see your arm, and I'll hook you up. Yeah, I think this will be helpful for anybody who's starting off the process. Yeah, I hope so. That's that's what my goal is. I want to be able to say to someone, uh, if I can help one person by putting this out there, just one person so that they're not overwhelmed when they walk in for it. All right. Not everyone at my center has a means of getting to their treatments, so they use the buses that come in and, and pick you up, deliver you to the center. A lot of people at the centers have to use public transportation with the buses. When they do, they end up spending at least an hour in advance waiting for the bus and up to two hours at the end waiting for a bus. It's much better for you, the patient, if you can arrange private transportation. Um, a relative, a neighbor, even through the church. My brother-in-law donates his time up on Long Island and has a patient that he drives to dialysis and from dialysis. That way you're not sitting there waiting endlessly. People have told me that it takes up to two hours for them to have the bus arrive. And there's nothing they can do about it because it's public transportation. That's brutal, huh? It's brutal. So you're saying that's a good tip there. There's people at the churches who will donate their time. Right, exactly. There are people, if, if you're you know, at a church, they will take you there and pick you up. Even a neighbor might do it for you. You have it, to ask, right? You have to ask. And it's, it's much better for you. You've just spent three and a half hours sitting in a chair. You don't want to spend another hour and a half, two hours waiting for a bus in the in the lobby. And we might have missed on this subject, but, but if you drink too much water, you it could damage your heart, and you actually don't drink much water per the day, do you? Right. I limit myself. I have about uh, a large glass in the morning and a large glass afternoon, evening. Other than that, the water that I take in is from cooking, from foods, from... Uh, uh, if I have a soup, it's considered water. If you have, uh, say, applesauce, it's liquid. It's sure. it's considered some water. So you water. have a big glass of iced tea in the morning and, and a big a glass. Big glass and a glass lasts me from the afternoon into the evening. And then, of course, you have the water from your food. Right. Now, tell us about what happens if they pull too much water. Okay. If you take in too much water, 
that means they have to pull that much water out of you. It's, it's hard on your heart to have the water pulled out of you. It can uh, damage the heart. It, it creates stress on the heart. If they don't pull the water, you can get congestive heart. So they're caught between the good and the bad. They have to do what they, you know, what a, is best. A rock and a hard place right. there. Right. If you take in too much water, you may have to go for extra treatments. I've seen patients who couldn't get out of their car because they, they took in too much water over the weekend. They send them right to the ER. Now I'm and sure this is something the doctors do tell you not to drink too much water. The, when I started on dialysis, they told me two liters of water, which is a large bottle of Coke, one of those large empty bottles. Two. They said that's the maximum I should drink in a day. So if I'm going every other day for dialysis, that's like two liters of Coke. Is, it's just about what I'm doing with a glass in the morning, glass at night, glass the next morning, glass before I go in because I go in at night. So that's an important point there in the beginning you should watch had definitely watch watch, water. watch your water intake don't drink right. too much right and the other thing that beginners forget to do beginners forget to take their binders um, they don't like to take the 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 Renvella or the Foslo that they're prescribed first off it's an expensive drug if they don't have the insurance coverage for it second off it has side effects where you get either constipated you get the runs it's not a pleasant drug with the after effects, but you have to take it because if you don't, it'll damage your heart. And you take that every day? I take it every meal. Every meal? Right. I take it every meal. So it's important to take that drug. What do you call it again? Well, there's two that are the most common, Foslo and Renvella. I take Renvella. Every time at meal? Every time at meals, every time you snack. And that's, again, if you don't take it, that could damage the heart? that'll damage the heart. The phosphorus and the potassium build up in your blood. They don't get removed with the dialysis. So there's so much details, there's so much involved in this and uh, like we say we're just trying to share some experiences right. in the patient's view. Marilyn, right. thanks a lot for sharing us the experience you have. Uh, you've been on the dialysis machine for five years now. That's correct. And what is that dog's name? This is Scruffy. That's Scruffy. Yeah, she looks Scruffy. All right. Well, thanks for sharing your experience. Okay, thank you.